morning's reading comes from Exodus 6, and it's verses 1 through to 13. Exodus 6, verses 1 through to 13. And after the reading, Liz is going to come and do the children's talk. Exodus 6. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them from his land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as, soj as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord God Almighty, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you to the land that I swore to give Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel. But they did not listen to Moses because he had broken because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So the Lord said to Moses, Go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. And gave, them charge, and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Lord, we thank you that 
as we read the accounts in the Bible, we read, Lord, that uh, when he was on the cross, the veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom, signifying that now we who love you are able to come into your immediate presence. And Lord, what wonderful privileges that, that is for us. Thank you that we who were once far off have been made near by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you again. We must come often to Calvary. Our Calvary covers it all, our past with its sin and stain. And Lord, how could we approach you? We who were born in sin, shaped in iniquity, and uh, our tendency is to sin because of the flesh, the world, and the devil. But we thank you for victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been reading about the promises of God, which are sure and certain. And Lord, we have proved you to be faithful and the unchangeable God. Lord, we can't always trust men's words. They promise things, but they never keep their word. We're hearing it even in high places that deceit has come in and caused corruption and many fields, Lord, and faces of our society. Lord, we are sickened by what we see and what we hear, but we thank you that there is perfection and peace knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. That as we come into your presence, Lord, we come with integrity, we come with, in, with reverence because we come into one who is far high and so holy. We want to thank you for the privilege that we have of worshipping you together on this day, in this place. It is a good thing, your word declares, to give thanks unto the Lord. And we come with worship and adoration to the one who loved us and gave himself for us. So Lord, we thank you for our little fellowship here. We thank you for one another, for those who have come back from holiday and been refreshed. For those who have gone away, we think, well, Pastor Morrison was away this month, Lord. We Pray that you will go with them, keep them safely, and bless them with great refreshing. Uh, we do thank you for their faithful ministry to us here as a church. And we thank you for each other, Lord, that we can encourage one another in the Lord. We thank you that it's a good thing for us to love one another. It's the right thing. And as we've been reminded in the children's story, we built our foundations on the solid foundation. The Lord Jesus Christ, the immovable one. One who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we thank you that when he completed that work at Calvary, he was able to shout, it is finished. He wasn't finished, but it was finished. The work that he came to do to cleanse us from our sin. What a wonderful truth that is, that we who are captives have now been set at liberty to be those to be able to free Really come into your presence and to exalt your name together. So we want to thank you for the privileges of being your children. Thank you for the promises of God. Thank you for the faithfulness of our Heavenly Father and for your providences in our lives. We thank you as we commit our way unto the Lord, you direct our paths and you bless us, Lord, in providential places, some of them hard places, but Lord, you bring them through again. Reading about the storms of life, in that, or hearing about the storms of life in the children's story this morning. And Lord, we thank you that when the storms of life come, we have an anchor that keeps us all steadfast and sure whilst the billows roll. Passing to the rock which cannot move, grounded, firm and deep in the Saviour's love. And so, Lord, we pray that we will hold fast to that which is good and that you will help us to walk a walk that is pleasing to you. Lord, that we will lay aside all those things that would easily beset us and set our gaze upon the one who has loved us and given himself for us. We pray for our nation, Lord. We need your intervention. We need your intervention in the world. Lord, we are seeing sin on every hand and we are grieved and upset by what we see. And we see these senseless acts, Lord, of uh, evil infiltrating almost every nation of the world and we particularly think of the Ukraine again this morning mm -hmm. Lord for the, the Russians as well who are suffering Lord it seems such a senseless thing that is happening but Lord you pray 
again that it will protect your people and out of it somehow Lord that you will bring some good. Mm. Oh Lord we need an intervention by you. Mom seems to be unable to do anything at the moment. It seems to be out of our control but nothing is out of your control. You are the one who is sovereign over all and that you will only allow what you allow. And in your mercy Lord we are asking to intervene and come into our world again. And may we know the blessing of the, your grace and mercy to us, Lord. We know that with one word you could wipe us all off the face of the earth. But Lord, you are a gracious God. You are a loving God. You are a merciful God. Mercy, there was great, and grace was be. Pardon, there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. So Lord, we will never forget your love for us. And Lord, we ask in you to keep us walking faithfully with you. Uh, pray for the work of your Holy Spirit whom you have given us. We thank you without his power. We could not live in a world that was so full of sin. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord, that you told us that we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And that our hearts are the temples of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Oh Lord, may we know that witness of his Spirit with our spirits, that we are the children of God. Oh Lord, comfort us with these words we pray. May we look to you, look about the circumstances that surround us, and look to the hope, the positive hope of Jesus Christ. We look under the heavens, and from whence cometh our help? Well, our help comes from the Lord. So we ask for your help and your grace in our daily living, in our, in our towns and cities, all in Wales, in the nation of Great Britain and the world. Lord, we need you to be a, 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 a God who will intervene and give great grace and love to those who are in darkness. So Lord, hear our cry. And we ask you to continue to pray for Mark as he brings God's word to us today. May we open our hearts and we will bless him with the power of your spirit as it brings us to word today. May our hearts be strangely warm as we listen to the God who is with the children of Israel. I am the God who is with you, he said, and he never deserted them, and he will never abandon us either, Lord. He said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. So, Lord, we thank you that we are safe and secure from all the lives because of Christ Jesus, our Saviour. To him we offer our worship this morning and ask you to continue with us in our meeting now. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Um, yes, as David prayed, Mark is going to be bringing us today's sermon, but if you have a look, a look around, Mark isn't in the building. Uh, but he has recorded a sermon for us. So we are going to sing our next song, which is God is Working His Papers Out. Um, and then um, I'm going to try and put Mark on the screen. <laughs>
Well, good morning. I'm sorry that I'm not there in person this morning. I booked to go to Town Hill before I realized that Stuart was not going to be here today. So uh, again, my apologies, but this is the best I could do. And now over the next few weeks, uh, I want to look at the deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt. Uh, I want to look at the nine plagues of Egypt today, the first nine plagues today. I want to look at the Passover next week. And then the week after, God willing, the crossing of the Red Sea. Now, obviously, such as a, a huge chunk of scripture in three weeks it is not going to give us much time to go into any depth. But, but I do hope that there will be some benefit for us in, in what we look at today. This, this is a, a, a big passage, isn't it? A, a great passage. So today, the first nine plagues are poured out on Egypt. Uh, and I've got three headings which I am going to use to direct our thoughts, okay? The headings. Heading number one, promise. Heading number two, progress. Heading number three, purpose. So promise, progress, and purpose. So point one, promise. Moses. Moses, uh, at the beginning of this story, Moses is in Midian. He, he fled from Egypt some 40 years ago. Uh, he is 80 years old by now. He, he has become a shepherd. And one day he's wandering in the wilderness, looking after his sheep, looking for pasture, looking for something to feed them with. And he comes across a bush that is burning uh, and yet it is not being consumed. He stops uh, as you would do. And, and he looks at the bush. And as he's looking at the bush, God comes and speaks to him. And we read Exodus chapter three, verses four to 10. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals from off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good land and a broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So there we have it. The scene is set. God is going to deliver the Israelites out of the hand of Egyptians. Easy, isn't it? It's all settled. Or well, when God decides to do something, God does it. And nothing can stop him and no one can stop him. You remember Nebuchadnezzar a little bit later on in the Bible. He is uh, he's a proud man and God comes and humbles him. Uh, and God decides that uh, Nebuchadnezzar is going to live as an animal for a number of years until he came to his senses and acknowledged that the most high rule is the kingdom of men and gives them to whom he will. <clears throat> and eventually Nebuchadnezzar says in Daniel 4, this is 34 and 35. He says, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honoured him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world at the time of Moses, needed to learn this exact same lesson that Nebuchadnezzar learned. Nebuchadnezzar himself needed to learn it himself a few hundred years later. Today, Putin needs to learn this lesson. So does Biden. So does whoever becomes prime minister of Britain. So do the leaders of all the nations in the world today. They need to learn that there is a God in heaven to whom they need to bow uh, and to whom they need to worship. And we need to learn that same lesson ourselves, don't we? This is not just for the rich and famous. This is not just for the powerful. This is for all of us. God is in control. 
he does what he wills and nothing and no one can stop him. If you are a Christian this morning, then God has promised to take you home to be with him forever and nothing can stop him. If you have had your sin forgiven, if you are his child, he will hold you in the palm of his hand and nothing and no one will be able to snatch you away. You, you may have doubts. Uh, life may be hard. You may be faced with many difficulties. Some of those difficulties, I dare say, will be your own making and some will be other people's making. But God will not let you go and he will take you home to be with him. Jesus says, John 14 verses 2 to 3, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. If you are not a Christian this morning, God has said that he will pour out his wrath on you, just like he did on the Egyptians. Point two, progress, progress. Moses goes back to Israel. He meets the, sorry, Moses goes back to Egypt. He, he meets with the leaders of Israel and they are delighted that God has heard their cry. Uh, and then God, Moses goes to Pharaoh. Uh, and we read uh, Exodus chapter five, this is one and two. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast for me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. And moreover, I will not let Israel go. Now, here we have uh, oh, the outworking, really, of Psalm, chapter, of Psalm 2, don't we? Psalm 2, verses 2 and 3. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst apart and cast away the accords from us. Uh, and what is God's reaction to this? Verse 4 of Psalm 2, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in division. We have God versus Pharaoh. Now, Pharaoh doesn't believe in God. And as far as Pharaoh is concerned, he's got Pharaoh versus Moses. Pharaoh, the, the ruler of Egypt, the most powerful man in all the world, versus Moses, a has-been, an old man, who was once something special in Egypt, but that was a very long time ago. Pharaoh doesn't take account of God. He makes a huge mistake here, doesn't he? He takes no account of God whatsoever. We need to take account of God in our walk in this world, in what we see happening around us, in what we do, in what happens in our country. God has a plan. He is working that plan out. It is not his fault that we are not able to see it, is it? Now we have a series of events, nine plagues over a period of probably six or seven months uh, with Egypt being brought to its knees. Is this fair? You ask yourself, is this fair? Is God's argument with all the people of Egypt or is it with Pharaoh only? Now at the end of Genesis, we, we have the story of Joseph uh, and in that story, there, there is a terrible famine that strikes the land. But because of Joseph, the Israelites, sorry, the Egyptians are forewarned. And they know that during the seven years before the famine, they had to store the grain up and keep it and hold it in large storerooms. And then during the years of famine, they will have food. And, and Joseph collects loads and loads of food, so much food that it can't be counted. And during the years of famine, Joseph sells that grain. And he sells it not only to the Egyptians, but to the people that come from lands around. And during those seven years of famine, Joseph buys all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. The people around him, many, they come to Joseph, they say, we haven't got any more money, Joseph. Buy our land from us. And then they'll come back the following year. We don't have any money. We don't have any land to give you, Joseph. Buy our cattle from us. And then eventually they say to Joseph, Joseph. We've got nothing left. Buy us. Buy us. And this is what Joseph does. He buys the whole land of Egypt. He buys all the people, all the cattle, all the land. And they all belong to Pharaoh. Everything in Egypt belongs to Pharaoh. 
only the priests are free. Everyone else and everything else belongs to Pharaoh. When God strikes Egypt, God strikes Pharaoh. When God strikes Egypt, the people see that Pharaoh, Pharaoh who is a god in their eyes, cannot defend them. God strikes at the very heart of the Egyptian religion and he shouts at the people that he is far superior to their so-called gods. The plagues, the plagues attack the Egyptian gods. Uh, the Nile turns to blood. Uh, the Nile is worshipped as, as a giver of life in Egypt. Frogs infest the land. Uh, the Egyptians had, had a frog-headed god who gave life to people. Nature itself turns against the Egyptians. Uh, there are gnats and flies that swarm throughout Egypt. The cattle die. The people are inflicted with boils. And then comes hail. Hail mixed with fire. That must have been terrifying. Uh, and then locusts. Uh, and if you were thinking that these are a natural series of events, like um, sometimes you see it on telly, National Geographic, they, they've got programs out that say, this is just one natural series of events that follows another, and it's easily explained away. Think again, because Moses allows Pharaoh to set a time when plagues will stop, and at the time set by Pharaoh, God halts the plague. And then the last plague. There is darkness. The plagues start with an attack on the Nile, uh, one of the Egyptian gods, and here they end with an attack on the sun god. The sun is blocked. Pharaoh, the incarnation of the sun god himself, is powerless against the Lord. And for three days and three nights, they have nothing but darkness. But in the land of Goshen, where the Israelites live, there is light. Look at Pharaoh over this period. Pharaoh over this period, he starts by refusing to let the people go to worship God. And then he says they can. Then he changes his mind and he says that they can't. And then he tries to bargain with God. Let the men go, but you leave your animals behind and leave your children behind. You can't bargain with God, can you? Pharaoh should realize this. He needs to learn to realize this. You cannot bargain with God. God expects obedience. A friend of mine said a very long time ago, being a Christian should be really easy, shouldn't it? He said, God has told us everything we need to do. All we need to do is do it. It is easier said than done, isn't it? Because we have our own desires and our own lusts and our own pride and so on. And we want to do our own thing. In the passages of the play, we have Moses versus Pharaoh. We have Moses who does everything the Lord commanded him. And we have Pharaoh who hardens his heart. We have obedience from Moses and we have opposition from Pharaoh. Moses was obedient, but Pharaoh hardened his heart uh, and God allowed him to continue to harden it until finally God said, enough is enough. Uh, and the opportunity for salvation is taken away from Pharaoh. And this should frighten us, shouldn't it? Because God can withdraw the opportunity from repentance from those who continually harden their heart toward him. We read today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow might be too late. Today is the day of salvation. In the passages about the plagues, we have God warning Pharaoh and the Egyptians about what would happen. And, you know, in some of them, some of the, the Egyptians take notice and some don't. And some of the Egyptians are saved from some of the plagues and some of the Egyptians are not. God warns that a day of judgment is coming. And he warns you to flee from the wrath to come. Go to him. Ask for forgiveness before it is too late. Point three, the purpose. Why so many plagues? Why doesn't God just cut straight to the chase? Why doesn't he just come, kill the firstborn, and Israel can go straight away? Why doesn't he do that? You see, in Exodus 4, verses 21 to 23, we read this. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, 
let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. God knows where this is going. He knows where the events will end. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows what will happen. Why doesn't he just go straight there and cut out all the unpleasantness of the, of the plagues in between? There are, uh, that I see here immediately, there are four main reasons. There are probably more, but these are the four that I came up with. There are four main reasons. The first one is that, that the plagues here might be a witness to the saving power of God. This is said of Pharaoh in Exodus 10, verses 1 to 2. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians, and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. Tell it to your children. This is what God is saying to Moses. Tell it to your children. Tell it abroad. Tell how many great things the Lord has done for you. What has God done for you that you can tell other people? What has he done for me? He's forgiven our sin, hasn't he? He has given us a hope in heaven. Look back at all the things you can be grateful to God for. The food that we have on our tables every day, the cars that we drive, the clothes that we wear, the houses that we live in, the families that he has given us. God has been incredibly merciful and incredibly gracious to us. Praise him for what he has done and tell others. The second reason is to give an opportunity to repent. Even in such circumstances as we are in Egypt, if people are willing to repent, God is willing to forgive. Repent and obey is the only way to please God. It's the only way to become his servant. It's not by bargaining and by hardening your heart as Pharaoh wanted to do. Repent and obey is the only way. Pharaoh didn't want to do that. He pursued his own ad agenda to the detriment of all of those around him. In, in Exodus 10, verse 7, we read that Pharaoh's servants said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve their, the Lord their God. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? You know, when we're in the middle of our sin, we don't realize the state that we are in, do we? Uh, may God open our eyes so that we can see what we are doing to ourselves, to our relationship with God, uh, maybe to other people around us as well. The third reason is that this is used for Pharaoh's condemnation. You see, it is not only Christians that will know that God is God and that will bow the knee to him. Everyone will know that God is God and everyone will bow the knee. Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 to 11. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every time confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Even the Egyptians would know this. Exodus 7 verses 3 to 5. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand upon Egypt and bring my hosts, the people of the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. The people of Egypt will not worship God, but they will know that they will be left in no doubt that God is Lord. The Egyptians have their own gods, but they will know that the Lord, the God of Israel, is far superior to their gods. Do not let what you hear about God and about Jesus be used for your condemnation when you meet God. Don't be in a position where you, you know that what you heard was right and you ignored it and you pushed it to one side and you did nothing with it. Don't be like that. Make sure that when you meet God, you will be right with him. The fourth reason is that God's name should be proclaimed throughout the earth. Exodus 9, verses 14 to 16. 
For this time, I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and your people, so that you may know that there is none like me in all of the earth. For by now, I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose, I have raised you up to show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. God's name is worthy to be proclaimed throughout the earth simply because of who God is. Whether you believe in him or not, God has given you life and one day he will take it away from you and you will stand before him in judgment and you will tell him about everything that you have done in this life, everything that you have said, everything that you have thought. And he will ask you a question. He will ask you, what have you made of Jesus? What have you done with Jesus? Has he forgiven your sin and made you right with God? What will your answer be? Will you be a trophy of grace or will you be an object of condemnation? There is one plague to come, the death of the firstborn, uh, the release of Israel from bondage comes with that, a, a real event uh, and also a picture of what Jesus was going to do for his people a um, thousand, twelve hundred years later. Uh, we will look at that, God willing, next week. Thank you for listening.
Lord, we thank you that we've been able to meet. Lord, we thank you that we've been able to reflect on the promises of your word. Lord, Lord, we thank you that we've been able to reflect that you have a purpose, Lord, that is working its itself out. And we may not be able to see, we may not be able to see the full picture, Lord, but we know that you are above everything, above time, mm. watching us and keeping us, Lord. Lord, we pray that you'll bless this morning's message to us, Lord. Lord, we pray that you bless the rest of this morning's um, time of fellowship with each other, Lord. Um, Lord, I pray that you'll keep us safe now, Lord. Amen. Mm.